Uh, next up, we have Mr. Buddy Machini. Uh, Buddy Machini is the research director at a very interesting startup called Airware. Uh, Airware is raising money from Y Combinator, Anderson Horowitz, and Google Ventures to create something like an operating system for drones. Now, this is a key step to starting to get some of the research that you've seen this morning out of the lab and into the field for application developers to start first with what they want to do with drones and then to leverage the technology. So we're here to tell us about that. If you'll please give us a warm welcome, Mr. Buddy Machini from Airware. Thanks, Ben. Man, how do you follow a presentation with so many cool videos and he even brought Colbert in? This guy's a pro. Uh, I'm Buddy, I'm the director of product and R&D at Airware, uh, and I wanna to talk to you today about developing a development platform for unmanned aerial systems. And I realize that the acronym UAS may seem like old timey at this point, um, but it is the industry preferred nomenclature, uh, and I've been told that I mustn't say the D word, uh, which is drones. Okay, so uh, a little bit about my background. Um, just finished a PhD at MIT's Aerospace Controls Lab with Professor John Howe. Uh, we built lots of things, including this uh, variable pitch quad rotor. Uh, we asked ourselves, how can we do more flips than they're doing at Grasp Lab? And so we decided, well, what if we did less flips? And so this can do a half a flip. Um, <laughs> take that. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of hobbyists here, you've played around with these uh, electric multi-rotors, and you know that the battery life is not very good. Uh, they only last for about 10 minutes. So, so we designed this, uh, this is called a mobile battery swap and recharge station. The vehicle lands, the battery goes out, a new battery comes in, and it takes off within about 30 seconds. So uh, this enables truly autonomous missions with multiple vehicles, uh, uh, for multiple hours with zero human intervention. Um, and just in case you're curious, the previous version of this technology was an undergrad who we hired to just stand there and, and replace the batteries. So the new technology, much more reliable, and it complains a lot less. Uh, so my own research had to do with robot learning from demonstration, uh, where I would teach uh, a quad rotor some flight maneuvers, and then it would be executed on the learned system. And of course, for it to be researched, it has to do flips. And so we taught it how to do uh, a flip. So what do these things have in common? Uh, we had to design an in-house uh, custom autopilot to meet these, the various research needs uh, for these very diverse projects. Uh, this type of product doesn't exist on the market. Um, it was time consuming to design, it was a distraction, and it really kept us from doing the research that we actually wanted to do. Uh, so I want you to introduce you to Jonathan Downey. Uh, in 2013, Jonathan is the CEO at Airware and unfortunately my boss. Uh, but back in 2006, Jonathan was a lowly nerd at MIT and he was working on this plane. This plane was designed uh, for the AVSI student UAV competition, and the competition changed from year to year. So what Jonathan did was he designed a modular autopilot where the parts could be seamlessly interchanged to meet the changing mission requirements. Again, nothing like this existed on the market, uh, and so he had to build his own. So at some point, Jonathan and I were friends at MIT, and we started talking about our experiences designing autopilots. Uh, we, we began to wonder why why don't these you know, sort of development platforms exist in the market? So, so if you lay out what does exist, on one end of the spectrum, you have what we call black boxes. Uh, these fly these very seriously named military planes like the Predator and the Global Hawk and the Reaper. Um, and there are a few things. So they're expensive. Uh, uh, even despite the shutdown, we know that the government loves spending money. Uh, and we couldn't afford these. They're consistent. They have very consistent performance. They're proprietary, completely proprietary in most cases. Uh, and the real deal breaker is that they're static. They don't change. Uh, we think of these like digital calculators. So a digital calculator never makes mistakes. It always does the same thing. But if I wanted to change something about the calculator, I'd, I don't even know where to start. I'd have to go to the person who made the calculator. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the plethora of DIY autopilots. Uh, these are autopilots that are oftentimes made from scratch um, for one reason or another. Uh, these are typically cheap. They are temperamental. Might be a good word for them. If, I'm sure the hobbyists in the room uh, know what I'm talking about. Uh, they're open and they're customizable. Uh, the problem is that if you design something to be totally customizable, uh, you find that it's often time consuming to get it to do one thing particularly well. That's at least what we found. So there's a great analogy actually to be had here um, with the dawn of modern computers. So, on one end of the spectrum, you had these commercial mainframes. These were expensive. They were oftentimes proprietary. And the problem was that they were disparate. So they, the way that you use them, the programming languages, the size of the punch cards, 
um, they changed from manufacturer to manufacturer and even from model to model. On the other end of the spectrum, as computer parts became cheaper and more readily available, you had the DIY computers. Um, some famously, like the, the Apple one here. Uh, these were cheap. They were open. That was the whole point to, to kind of get this technology out there. Um, but the problem was that they were also disparate. Uh, they, they, uh, no two were the same, and the software that would run on one may very well not run on the other. So what changed everything? It was, uh, as you probably know, the personal computer. And what made the personal computer so special? Uh, somewhere between expensive and cheap, it was affordable. Somewhere between proprietary and open, the personal computer was structured. Uh, but it wasn't just these two things that make the personal computer so successful. So let's rewind to 1982. Uh, this is an ad uh, for Microsoft DOS. Now I know that these days, when you think of Microsoft, the word prescience probably doesn't come to mind. But I think that they had this one right. Uh, second line of the ad says, the success of any microcomputer system depends on the amount of software available for it and the ability, uh, sorry, and the ease of writing more. So, so I think that's what made personal computers uh, so successful, and that was they made things compatible. They enforced compatibility between the many hardware manufacturers, the many software developers, and the users themselves. I admit, though, that I wasn't even alive when all this was happening. Uh, but there was an example in my own lifetime, uh, and that is cell phones. So, so you remember these? It wasn't too long ago, uh, since probably you had one of these and you remember what color it was. Mine was orange. And besides making uh, calls and, and maybe sending text messages, the, the coolest thing you could do on these things was play Snake, um, as, a, <laughs> yes, thank you, as I learned through most of sixth grade. Uh, so what changed? Well, it took a while, but in, sometime around 2007, someone probably said that the success of any cell phone system depends on the amount of software available for it and the ease of writing more. So now uh, we have operating systems that act as development platforms. And we have apps for everything. We have apps for banking, apps for mapping, apps for browsing, apps whose job it is just to keep an eye on all the other apps. Uh, and what the platform did was it revolutionized the technology in cell phones. So back to drones. What's missing from the space uh, is a product that somewhere between expensive and cheap is affordable, uh, is importantly safe, uh, between proprietary and open is structured, and most importantly, a product that imposes compatibility uh, between many different things. Uh, and so th this is why we started Airware. Uh, and it's more than just a piece of hardware that sits in the middle here. The airware development platform imposes compatibility between the many aircraft, sensors, payloads, and the multitude of software that are required to enable a wide range of UAS missions. Uh, so for the same reasons the platform transforms cell phones and computers, uh, the platform transforms uh, unmanned systems. Now, one of the things that cell, phone, cell phones and computers didn't have to worry about was safety, um, but a unified platform also promotes safety because it becomes a single core unit uh, that you can certify, regulate, and support uh, because the, this, the core of it doesn't change from instance to instance. So I don't want to, I don't want to tell you too much about our product. Uh, I want to tell you what our beta customers are doing with it. So Delta Drone uses these for geological surveying uh, for things like mining. They do skier search and rescue, precision agriculture, et cetera. Uh, cyber technology uses them for Emergency services assistance, fire brigade assistance, things like that. Uh, the, a team from MIT funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, we're working with them. They want to deliver vaccines and medicines in Africa. I think the MIT guys are here this weekend, and they're probably wondering who these guys are. These are a few of our applications engineers. Uh, the Olpegeta Conservancy in Kenya, uh, we're working with them to develop a UAS solution for anti-poaching to protect the endangered northern white rhino. Uh, and as an example of how the platform makes sense here, they're thinking about tagging the rhinos with RFID tags so they can more easily track them. Uh, and incorporating an RFID reader into the black boxes or the DIY solutions is oftentimes very, very difficult, uh, but in the platform, it makes it much easier. Uh, so one of our partners, uh, Spadero Aerospace, has been doing their own anti-poaching operations in a national park in Africa, and I wanted to share a picture that they showed us. Uh, this is a, a picture of a suspected poacher. Um, the, so the, the, as the story goes, as it was told to us, the first thing the poacher did when he saw the drone, and this is an electric-powered multi-rotor, as many of you are familiar with, was he put his hands up. That was the very, very first thing that he did. 
Uh, once he realized that no one was around, he literally ran in the other direction. So as these examples show, uh, drones or UAS, call it whatever you want, can be used as tools for a wide variety of applications that in a lot of cases can make our world better. Um, as the applications become more and more different, the platform becomes more and more important that acts as the focal point of technology, of capability, and of safety. Uh, and that is what we're really excited to be building at Airware. So thank you for your time.